is uh, I want to talk about basically why I think we need a king. Why I think we need a king. And I get it. You know, sometimes when we come together as a church and we gather to pray and to worship and we come to hear a sermon, sometimes we wonder what's the relevance, right? Like I've been in the pews too. I've been at various lectures and conferences and gospel meetings. And I've wondered about various, uh, you know, the relevance of various lessons that we give. And it sometimes seems like the church is giving answers to questions that we're not even asking, right? And I don't know if you've thought about even though our series is actually <laughs> titled Jesus is King, which has been for 2019. I don't know if you've ever thought about the question, is Jesus a king? I don't know how many times you think about that in the middle of the day. How is he a king? In what way does he rule as king? Maybe this is something that you feel like you've championed. And if that's so, if you've been a Christian for a while, if even you're, you can remember various generations of your family raised in the church, wasn't the case for everybody, but if you can remember that and you thought, you know, we have this down, we get it, Jesus is king, I want you to re-examine that belief in your own life today because this is so relevant to everything that is going on right now. The question, is Jesus king? It goes all the way back to a passage that we have in the book of Judges. Yeah, I was actually able to teach a Bible class in the book of Judges uh, some years ago. And I was astounded as I was reading this entire book that it is all about one question in a text there in Judges chapter 17 and verse 6. And right towards the end, whenever it's bookending this particularly heinous episode in the life of Israel, it says at the beginning of Judges 17, at the end of Judges 21, it has one question. It says, in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And that is a perfect summation of what we're going through right now in our own society, in our own world, in our own families, right? There is no king of Israel. Everyone does what is right in their own eyes. We need a king. And it's not easy whenever we have grown up distrustful of authority. You have grown up distrustful of authority. We live in a country where, unfortunately, when we think of king, we think King George III, right? <laughs> and we all know how that ended, okay? We're celebrating Independence Day, move on the fireworks, that's the way we're celebrating. We live in a time where we're immensely suspicious of all authority, especially male authority. You know, we grew up maybe with lazy, aloof, even drunken fathers, we have abused authority. We think about somebody in a suit in some sort of institution way high up, just abusing their power. We think about all of the depictions of the stupid dad archetype in sitcoms, right? And you just pick your sitcom, I promise you there's a stupid dad in there somewhere. It all is there to inculcate, to instill this idea that we don't need a king. But all the problems that we have are due to the fact that we do not have a king. People living today without purpose, right? So many people, my generation, ad nauseum, I hear it. I'm up to my eyeballs in complaints. I, I don't feel like I have a mission. I don't have a purpose. All due to the fact we don't have a king. Dying without peace, we don't have a king. Without aim or guidance in our life, we don't have a king. Without strong mentorship in our lives and guidance and purpose and drive instilling in us, we don't have a king. You know, the Japanese tell a parable, a story of a heron. A heron's a big old ghoulish bird that hangs around ponds to eat fish. They tell this parable about a heron, and it's about this pond that had lost its king. And finally, all the pond dwellers decide to elect this king, all the tadpoles, all the fish, all the frogs, and they elect a heron to be their king. Short story, the heron ends up eating everyone. Okay? And that's, that's precisely the point is that you might think that you don't have a king, but all of us elect a heron if we're not electing Jesus. All of us choose to be allegiant to some sort of power, to some sort of, uh, of thing to worship, to some sort of uh, a mainstay in our lives. And if it is not Jesus, it will eat us up. And this is the world that we live in and the world that we carry with us as we go into the text given to us today. In Mark chapter 15, and beginning in verse 1. This is going to be page 852 in your pew Bible. In case you're visiting with us and you're using a pew Bible, please feel free to grab that. Page 852 there, Mark 15, beginning in verse 1.
And as soon as it was morning, the chief priest held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And then Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered him, You have said so. And the chief priests accused him of many things. And Pilate asked again, have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the feast, Pilate used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for him. And he answered them saying, do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead of Jesus. And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with this man you call king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him! And Pilate said to them, Why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him! And so Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters. And they called together the whole battalion. They clothed them in a purple cloak, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him. And they began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews! And they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. And they led him out to crucify him. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene by name, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by derided him. They wagged their heads and they said, Aha, you would who destroy the temple and rebuild in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. And those who were crucified with him also reviled him. And this is God's word. It should be obvious as we read that text that Mark's point is Jesus is king. Did you guys gather that? One of the keys in Bible study is to look at repeated refrains, repeated uh, texts there. And notice that in verse 2 of chapter 15, verse 9, verse 12, verse 18, verse 26, verse 32, we have the chorus of the song, Jesus is king, king of the Jews, king of Israel, Jesus is king, Jesus is king. When Jesus dies, Mark is trying to make the point that when he dies, he dies chiefly as a king, that the whole struggle of the Christian life, I'm telling you this right now, my fellow brothers and sisters, my disciples, people here right now together with me, the struggle of the Christian life is to see Jesus as a king king as your king. And I want to help us to see this today by making two points that I, I get from the text, two points that come straight from the text. And here's what we're going to do. What I want to do is I want to develop a contrast between what Jesus gives and what we give. That's what's happening in the story here. Contrast what we give with what Jesus gives. In other words, point number one is what did we do for our king? Point number two is what did our king do for us? All right. Here we go. Point number one, what did we do for our king? Well, in a word, we crucified him. This is where we try to answer the question, what actually happened to Jesus on that day? You know, we don't often have lessons that explicate in great detail 
the sufferings of Jesus on that day. What was the whole process of crucifixion? We have to understand that Mark is giving us the details here, and it happens in three phases, okay? Here's phase number one. Phase number one, beginning of verse 15 there in your Bibles, John, in Mark chapter 15, is the scourging, the flogging, some translations say. Now, the scourging is where we have to start because this was really the starting point of the execution of criminals who were going to be crucified in this day. It was always the beginning. And what typically happened is that the victim would be brought there, tied to a post, and he would be in between two Roman lictors. Think of them as Roman linebackers, okay? These were huge guys, lictors. And they would each be uh, holding in their hands there a flagellum, which was a whip of sorts. And history tells us that these whips were cruelly designed on the various strands there, would be sometimes pieces of bone, sheep's bone. We'd have metal balls. Sometimes they would even have hooks placed in them. And I don't know how many times you guys have heard this. Maybe you guys have heard this in a Bible study, but we are always told Jesus suffered 39 lashes, right? Have you guys ever heard that before? 39 lashes. Well, it's not entirely true. Because if you think about 39 lashes, yeah, that was the tradition of the Jews. They would beat somebody 39 lashes to save them from actually overstepping the limitation at 40. But he was not suffering under the hand of the Jews at this time. It was the Romans. They didn't have a law saying you couldn't beat him past a certain number. Who knows how many lashes he suffered. And here's another thing. A lot of Renaissance art and religious art, you know, save us by putting a loincloth on Jesus. Jesus, the victim, all the victims would have been completely in the nude, posterior, absolutely exposed. And as he was whipped there between the two Roman lictors, deep contusions, lacerations, he would basically be flayed alive, even having strands of skeletal muscle suffer, surfacing. Most often died from this beating alone. Now that tells us two things about Jesus. Number one, the fact that he was still alive tells us that Jesus was a strong man. You know, the Bible tells us that Joseph was a tecton. He was an architect, which means he could have been a carpenter. He could have been a stonemason. I think most likely he probably dealt with stone. Think about the thickness, the strength, the power of Jesus, that he's even alive after this beating. But it tells us another thing, that he couldn't even carry his cross to Golgotha, which tells us he was probably suffering some sort of hypovolemic shock, which is basically where your body loses enough blood that your heart is reacting by pumping blood that isn't there. His blood pressure is dropping, his kidneys are shutting down, he's suffering from extreme thirst. That's what happened to Jesus when he scourged. Here's phase two. He's mocked. Beginning in verses 17 through 20. And, you know, I was reading this and I, I was studying the historical context of the mocking and I couldn't help but think about the few people in their life who I was, I was able to be there at their deathbed. And you know, sometimes, many, many of you guys have the same experience, sometimes when you're at the deathbed of something, at someone, sometimes death is a very violent process, even if they're just peacefully fading out. And it could potentially be a very undignified experience. You're having your last moments with this person you love, Nurses keep coming in and disrupting them when all they need to do is get some sleep, get some rest. It gets a little annoying. It can be very undignified, and you treat them with the utmost care because this is their last moment on earth. And yet, Jesus was humiliated. I mean, I believe he died as much from shame as he did from his wounds. They clothed him like a king in a mock coronation. And you know what they sang to them? Just to modernize a little bit, they sang, Hail to the chief! who triumph, who in triumph advances, honored and blessed be the evergreen pine, right to his face. And when he was thrown around naked, can you imagine the crude and cruel jokes he suffered from these uncircumcised Roman men against this observant Jew? Far worse than some of the horror stories you read about with the atrocities in the concentration camps when after the Nazi guards would strip the various prisoners there, they would not even allow them to comfort or soothe themselves with their own embrace. They couldn't even touch themselves. The third and final phase is the execution proper, which we're told about in verses 24 and following. 
Jesus carries the cross beam of his cross. It's probably not the entire cross, as many paintings depict, but it's probably just the cross beam where his wrists would be nailed. He carries it to be finally nailed to this tree. In verse 23, we're actually told that he's offered a narcotic. I don't know if you've ever wondered what wine mixed with myrrh would have been, but to a certain amount, if you consumed it enough, it would have dulled the pain. And they offer this to him, and notice that Jesus doesn't take it, he spits it out. He, he, not even he spits it out, I'm, I'm thinking about a movie, sorry. He, he, he doesn't take it at all. He doesn't dull the pain. He doesn't receive this narcotic at all. And in order to stretch out his arms to the right length, many victims have both shoulders dislocated. Spikes about five to seven inches long would be driven through the wrists, not the palms, the palms would not have had enough flesh, enough bone, enough strength to hold up the prisoner. Probably would have been driven straight through the wrist. The nerves in his feet would have been crushed by the nail driven there. And finally, once he was hanging, he would die a slow, excruciating death by asphyxiation. Suffocation, essentially. He couldn't breathe. Because what's interesting about this position is that as this person was being crucified, as they're placed in this position, their diaphragm is being extended to the point that it would have been in a permanently inhaled position. These people could not breathe. He'd have to, in order to exhale, he would have to actually push on his feet up, rubbing his bloody back against this rough wood, and eventually he'd be too exhausted to push up any longer. And as he slows his breathing, he would have undergone what uh, many medics call respiratory acidosis. In other words, the acidity of his blood would increase, causing an irregular heartbeat, and then finally he would die by cardiac arrest. It was the worst death you could imagine in that day. There was nothing worse than this. And all the while, as he is surrounded by people watching him die, this humiliating death, we're told that above his head was a placard nailed. Now, Romans would put the placard there because crucifixion was a sign, a symbol to all of the onlookers, right? Whenever you hang them high, you tell all the criminals they better beware. That's what's happening here. It was their sick joke. You want to be a king? You want to have an insurrection against the Roman Caesar? You want to be high and lifted up? Well, we'll lift you up high. And so all the people coming into the city, even Jesus as a boy, you can imagine, it probably would not be far-fetched to think that he would have seen people crucified. This sign was placed there to tell all onlookers, this is the reason why this criminal was executed. And that sign said nothing else but Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Kind of redefines the whole saying, uneasy lies the head that wears the crown. Now, is this some kind of sick joke? How is he king? This is what the Bible tells us. I mean, it, it is exceedingly strange that our religion is one that worships a crucified man. Is this some kind of sick joke? Why would we make this our king? In order to understand that, we have to begin to proceed to the second point. And that is, now that we've understood what they did to Jesus, I want to ask the question, what did he do for us? If this is what we did to him, what did he do for us? Now, the points that I'm going to be deriving here are taken from three characters in this story that we just read. So it's all coming from the text, from the Bible. I'm not making this up, okay? And there are three significant interactions Jesus has with people in the story. Let's go through each of them. Here's the first one, his reaction or his interaction with Pilate, okay? What did our king do for us? Number one, he gives his truth to Pilate, okay? This is verses 1 through 15. Now, this interaction with Pontius Pilate is significant because it shows us that it wasn't just the Jews that were at fault, even though throughout history there have been a lot of anti-Semites who have just placed all the blame on the Jews, and it's not entirely true. Mark is telling us here that it was Jews and non-Jews both responsible for Jesus' crucifixion. Now, I want you to think about this. Let this resonate with you. The most religious people on the face of the earth and the most advanced legal system that has ever graced God's green earth, the Romans and the Jews, both colluded together to crucify this innocent man. If that does not rob the powers of all of their power and legitimacy, I don't know what does. 
What happens here is this Pilate is this sort of vacillating jellyfish of a politician. I want you to see Mark is trying to portray a contrast between Jesus and Pilate here standing next to each other. That Pilate is this vacillating jellyfish politician bending underneath the people's will when he knew, the text said, he knew Jesus was not guilty. What does Jesus do? Verse 2, Jesus is tall, he's firm, he's resolute, he's decisive, and he tells them, you're king of the Jews? You said it. I am. And in John's 18 account, in John 18, in his account of this interaction between Pilate and Jesus, Pilate even goes so far to ask, what is truth? And I find that interesting because it's a question that we're asking today. I mean, it's almost like a lost battle, right? We're asking, what is truth? What is truth? Is there such thing as truth? We have similar questions about pluralism and relativism and what is really absolute truth today. Is there such thing? You have your truth. I have my truth. Let's all share our various truths on Facebook and fight each other. Well, how about this for truth? Jesus says, I am king. And for this reason, I was born. And for this reason, I have come into the world in order that I can testify to the truth. And everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. We don't need spineless politicians to save us. We need a king. We need that kind of king. We need to place our hope in a king like that. We need to redefine the power. The redefinition of power that comes with the gospel is phenomenal. And I want to tell you, man, does this text not have something to say to us today in our political climate? Does it not have something to say to us today? That maybe, maybe, I'm not against politics, but maybe we might just be placing a little too much hope and emphasis on earthly, worldly politicians, as if that's going to save the day. Let me tell you something. Politicians come and go. Fads change all the time, but Jesus is forever. And he is king. And not only that, but he is a king worth emulating. He is one we can look up to and look at him as an ideal and a model and an exemplar to follow. He gives Pilate his truth. Jesus' crucifixion is one of the most historically verifiable facts in history. Why was he crucified? Mark has <laughs> belabored the point. He has helped us answer that question in a multiplicity of ways. Jesus was crucified because he judged the temple in Mark chapter 11. He was crucified because he challenged sacrifice in Mark chapter 2, actually implying he could be forgiven outside of temple sacrifice. He uh, is crucified because he challenged all of the Jewish traditions in Mark chapter 7. He is crucified because he wants to ransom his people from sin, Mark chapter 10. He's crucified because he claimed to be a king. Jesus gives us his truth. My question is what you're going to do. What are you going to do with it? Either he is who he said he was or he's not. Have any of us reckoned with that question in our lives? What will we do with that truth? Here's the second significant interaction Jesus has in the text. Not only does our king give us his truth, but he gives his cross to Simon, verse 21. Now, Pause for a second. Why is the story mentioned? Now, as we're going through the story, it just seems like a sort of, just comes out of left field, right? Oh, by the way, there was this guy named Simon. He was from Cyrene, and he helped Jesus carry his cross. Why is the story mentioned? Some people would say, A, it could be mentioned because it's just history, that it's given there as a historically verifiable fact. Even he mentions, did you notice he mentioned this, these people, Alexander and Rufus, as if Mark is almost assuming that people in his audience know who these people are. Oh, by the way, this Simon of Cyrene, Alexander and Rufus, you know them? That's, that's his dad. This happened. It's historical fact. These are footnotes to testify to this event. That could be one reason. But here's the second reason. The second reason is that this is a pattern that he is holding up for every disciple of Jesus. And that is to share Jesus' cross and to carry his burden with him. Every single person who reads this story should go back to that echo in John, uh, Mark chapter 8 and verse 34, when Jesus says, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. This is that story. And when these people heard that invitation to take up a cross, they did not hear metaphor. They knew exactly what the cross meant and they knew exactly what it meant for them as disciples to follow Jesus 
means to take up that cross of self-denial. It means to model our lives after this king, to behave as he did in the face of persecution, to tell the truth, even when it's hard, to know that you might even be betrayed as he was, and you have to learn how to love and forgive even as he did while he's being crucified. It means letting go of that oh-so-American quality of individualistic thinking, selfish desires, for a transcendent cause, to live for a cause bigger than yourself, to live for the king. Listen to me. I was talking to Amber about this. There's this pervasive, unspoken belief, even among the church, we are not free from it because we live in the culture. We watch TV like everyone else does. We're, We're just there drinking it all the time. There's this pervasive, unspoken belief that this life is all we got. We might say otherwise. We might say we believe differently. But many of us live like this is the only life we got. And we better maximize it. We better make it worth it. We don't believe. We don't believe at all that uh, it's going to be worth it in the end to take up our cross. To live in self-denial because there is a new world coming. All of that sacrifice, that there is reward at the end of it. Do we believe that? That is the cross, and Jesus needs help carrying it. The king gives us his cross, a responsibility and a duty. Let me tell you something. I hope that we can say at Brownsburg that God is teaching us here at Brownsburg that it is a privilege to carry that cross. The third thing he does is he gives his innocence to Barabbas. Last and final thing, verses 6 through 15 in the text. So notice in in the story, there's this weird tradition that follows the feast days there, particularly this one at Passover. And Pilate stands there before the people, and he offers a choice. And he says, basically, look, we can can let Jesus go, or we can let Barabbas go, okay? So just get in your mind. We can let Barabbas go. We can let Jesus go, okay? Two choices before the people, one or the other. One is innocent, Jesus, though accused of being an enemy of Rome, which is so ironic. So ironic. Because here is another one who's actually guilty, who actually murdered, inciting insurrection against Rome, who literally is an enemy of Caesar. And he says, your choice. And you know what's even crazier? Do you know what the name Barabbas means? Bar Abbas means son of the father. (laughs) On one side, we have the innocent son of the father, Jesus, who was condemned. Condemned that the guilty future sons of the father, those like Barabbas, Barabbas, might go free. Just as it is written, for our sake, God made Jesus who knew no sin to be sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. It is everywhere in the text. I have, I have a, a slew of passages here that talk about this concept of substitution, that the innocent, the innocent is condemned so that the guilty can go free in our place, right? Or you, I'll, just, I'll just bring up one, Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. You can even just imagine the heart of Paul as he's pinning this to the brethren who live in Rome. When he says... Oh my goodness, for, for while we were helpless in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps even for a good man, one would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Our salvation is in his substitution. He says, my life for yours. I've asked the question, But why the crucifixion? Like, I I get this idea. The innocent is condemned. The guilty go free. Jesus needed to die so we can be forgiven our sins. But that doesn't explain the whole first part of the sermon where we talked about the godlessness of the pravity, the absolute atrocity of the crucifixion, the whole process. Why do you have to go that deep? Why do you have to push the envelope that far? I'm going to try to answer that question. I've met two types of people in my life. Mainly two, okay? Okay. There are those types of people who don't see sin and those types of people who see nothing but sin. 
And I think generally, I might be overgeneralizing a little bit, everyone in this room fits in one of those categories or the other. You're either a person who doesn't see sin in the sense that these are your no big deal, flippant attitude type of people. You know, nothing's a big deal. You know, all the doom and gloom and the gravity and everything's sort of a joke. And, and you know, they don't really need salvation. I don't really get the whole cross thing. Like, I don't feel like I'm a sinner. I don't really need to be saved. It's not a big deal. That's the whole sort of younger flippant attitude, right? The cross tells them that's what sin looks like. You want to know what God sees. It's not no big deal. That's what sin looks like. That's what it took for every sin, from your little peccadillo to Hitler's. That's what it took. But then to the other people, to those who see nothing but sin, those who are very self-deprecating, they, you know, they, they never think they can do right. Um, you know, if they were a character off Winnie the Pooh, they'd be Piglet, right? Like th these people, they're just very self-deprecating. You know what the cross tells them? The cross tells them there is literally nothing so bad Jesus can't forgive. There is nothing so bad that that cross could not pay for it because that's how far he went. Please hear me. Jesus is worthy as a king. He is worthy. He's not just given us his truth and died for it. He's not just given us a vocation, a duty, a real purpose to live for in this life by telling us to carry his cross along with him. But he's reached down to the very bottom, paying with his own lifeblood to save us from our sins and from hell that we might be in his presence forevermore. That is our king. Make him your king. Amen. Amen. If you're not a Christian this morning, that's our message. We end here, and we do look forward to the resurrection as we continue to track through Mark chapter 15. We do not leave the king on a cross, but if you are not saved, please know the price that's been paid on your behalf, that you might reign with Jesus here and now, being baptized in the water for the forgiveness of your sins by your faith and your proclamation that Jesus is Lord. If you have any need whatsoever, come right now while we stand and sing this song for your encouragement.